Tom Blavecchia here with the continuation of the New Theory Podcast. To keep it simple, we are now on iTunes, Google Play. We launched on SoundCloud and naturally the NewTheory.com website. We're focused on entrepreneurs, artists, and anybody that makes sense surrounding a millennial themselves or a millennial topic such as those from Gen X and baby boomers who have succeeded, who can lead and guide the way. With that being said, the podcast has taken off nicely. We just interviewed Nathan Alaka, who is the biggest, I believe, and ranked as the most important top business entrepreneur podcaster in the world. So we had a pretty cool talk um, and it was exciting. But our next guest, I share no less excitement for having on the show. I will probably mess up how I pronounce his name, but this is a guy that you will need to hear about and will not be forgotten. Nourish Visa, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? Doing awesome, Thomas. Thanks for the awesome intro. I'm excited to speak to you. All right. So I did have the, po- uh, the pleasure of speaking with Nourish, Nar- 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 right? Nourish? Nourish, yeah. Nourish, Nourish. I will get it. Nourish earlier, and we had a pretty good discussion. And the nice thing about this podcast is we kind of get to the who, the what, and the why, right? So who you who are you, Nourish? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Let's go through your formative years. Born and raised in Houston, Texas. My parents are immigrants from India. My father came to this country to study structural engineering, uh, actually civil engineering at Vanderbilt University. Uh, went out of state for college. Basically, when I left for college, never went back home to Houston. Uh, graduated from Syracuse University, journalism school, undergrad, Duke Business School, grad school, worked at a value hedge fund, worked at a large bull bracket, bulge bracket bank on Wall Street, have written for USA Today, Huffington Post, um, MSN Money, a few other outlets. Uh, started out as, as I mentioned, journalism undergrad, started out as a reporter, producer, publisher, director, etc. on TV, radio, and print, shifted over to the financial side of things, and then combined it all um, in my mid-20s, combined all of that, those skills and background to start my own business, Krish Media and Marketing, an online business solutions provider, and have also been involved, started, shut down, uh, bought, sold financial publishing businesses um, since then too. So I'm now in my late 20s and um, still run Chris Media and Marketing, still am a partner in several financial publishing businesses, and I'm also the number one best-selling author of two books. The first one is called Podcastnomics, the book of podcasting to make you millions. And the second one is called 50 Shades of Marketing, Whip Your Business into Shape and Dominate Your Competition. Okay. You have a lot of info. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to chop it up a little bit. So born, Let's in, do it. born in Houston. Uh, wait, you have a Duke MBA? Yes, I went to Fuqua School of Business and it's a it's it's a graduate degree for, it was a one year graduate degree from Duke's business school. So it, but what's the designation? MS or MBA? It's an MS. Dude, you got an MS from Fuqua. Like, you've lost over that. Like, if I got an MS from Fuqua, I would, like, tattoo that shit on my face. You know what I'm saying? I have an MBA <laughs> from, like, Fairleigh Dickinson University, which is, like, an overpriced private school. And the only reason I could afford it is because my company paid for it. You know what I'm saying? So, respect the Fuqua <laughs> right there. Uh, all right. I get that. So, now, okay. So, I'm big into So, I'm from the Jersey. My family's from Italy. So, we're both children of immigrants, right? We both probably have the immigrant mentality. Um, I hate people who say this, but I'm going to say this. I do have the pleasure of having a lot of Indian friends, right? I don't want people to say, oh, I have a lot of friends who are this. But I do have a lot of pleasure of Indian, <laughs> uh, having Indian friends. And with that said is I love the culture is surrounded around education. I love that. Not to generalize, but my experience has been with the people that I know who are from India or of first yep. generation tend to be maniacally focused on education. Did you get your masters kind of because you had to or you wanted to? It was uh, – I didn't have to. So I, I mentioned earlier that undergrad, one of my majors was uh, broadcast and digital journalism, which is 
not a very Indian field to go into. I mentioned my father was an engineer. Uh, most Indians go for engineering, something in the computer IT space, or in, uh, to medicine. Now, I went and got my graduate degree. Uh, it was completely my choice. I liked the program, and um, my parents didn't pressure me at all. It was obviously an add-on for them. Like, great, he's got a, he's going to go get his master's degree. That, that's really good. It's really marketable. But, Tom, to be honest with you, uh, I, I, I think uh, business school in general is a complete waste of time. It's Love overpriced. It. It's, it's overrated. And uh, outside of it adding more credibility to who I am, uh, business schools are archaic in their teachings. The professors have PhDs from pre-internet eras. They don't understand the digital economy. They don't understand the online space. They don't understand uh, the future of, of business and e-commerce. But at the same time, I'm, I made a lot of great friends and I had some good critical thinking while I was in business school. Um, I, I don't recommend people go into it uh, unless they just have no idea what they want to do with their life and um, want to have fun to party for a year or two. All right. So you decided to go there. In retrospect, it may be not uh, have been the best um, – it might not have been the best use of your time. Uh, I get that because we all, we all do things and, and then afterwards we're like, oh, shit, you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? So that I get. Um, I want to talk about the culture for a second because um, I myself, you know, uh, went against the grain of what I was kind of supposed to do as an Italian American sometimes with my with my mother who was a single mother, hardworking. But I did it with the goal of being successful. Have you ever had to do anything that might have went against maybe your parents, uh, culture, friendships, etc., cetera, uh, with the sacrificing of succeeding and bettering your life? My parents, surprisingly, as traditional as they may be, they're very open-minded and they were very supportive of what I went into, both as an undergraduate student going into the media space and having success there, and then also years later, um, after graduate school, after I worked the corporate jobs, I started my own company, which, uh, again, goes against the grain. And so they've been not just supportive, but my father encouraged me long before, even while I was in college, to start my own business and to, you know, try things out on my own. That's not a very common, uh, it, it's not common advice that you get from the, the Indian or South Asian region in general. And it's largely because in India, so not in the United, not Indians here in the United States, but in India, where you go to college and what you study will determine the rest of your life. It's not as easy in India to quit your job and start a business and start making money from day one, which is what I did when I got my business started. Um, it, it, it's not that simple. And then when it comes to actually getting jobs, qualifications and resumes and where you go to school and your grades matter much more than here in, in the United States. Here in the United States, you can get away with knowing with knowing people and talking yourself up and you see it all the time where people without college degrees here in the United States or college dropouts or even community college grads or dropouts, uh, they do, they can do incredibly well. This is the land of opportunity, but that's not the case in India. And so that mindset comes over to the United States when immigrants come over. And that's why Tom, as you were saying, a lot of your friends who you know, are super well educated. They have master's degrees. Maybe they they went to top notch universities or graduate schools or PhDs, medicine, engineering, IT, etc. Well, okay. So so you went against a grain. So let's talk about your business life now. What was your first entrepreneurial venture, uh, and why? Like, so why did you do it? What was the plan? What was it? You know, the how, the what, and the why. It, it all happened by by chance. So while I was in college, a company that I interned for it was a business radio station, a, a terrestrial radio on AM, out of a couple of markets around the, in the country. So it was kind of nationwide. 
they they wanted me to stay on as a contractor, even though my internship was over. It was a paid internship, and they asked me to stay on, and they said they'd pay me pretty well while I was in school, and I could continue to, to produce and manage radio shows while I was in school. So that was the first time I, I delved into entrepreneurship because I became a contractor, and I was able to contract my skill set that I was doing for this client out to several clients. So I scaled it out. And I, I scaled it out to various terrestrial radio stations uh, over a course of about three years. And then that's when I started switching over to the podcasting space. And uh, one of my clients ended up hiring me full time out of graduate out of graduate school. And I took over. I became the, I was uh, the youngest director ever at their company and ended up taking over that project and, and growing it. After a couple of years of experience doing that, that's when I felt comfortable to go out on my own because I had a set of clients already. I was still running my, my, my business on the side. I was still offering services on the side. So when I left my full-time job, I still had revenue coming in through the door from day one. There was no startup capital. There was no startup expense. I had a set of paying clients who, um, who wanted my services. That's how Christian Media and Marketing got started. And at the time, I was in my mid-20s. All right. So that brought you to mid-20s. Okay. So we're going to do two things. I want to talk more about your kind of author life. And then let's, then we'll get right into how it's going to make you money. So what was your first book? The podcast book? Podcast Comics was my first book. It was written as a result of uh, a low point that I was having in my business. I was in a lawsuit with a client. It was a six-figure lawsuit, and uh, it just seemed like uh, my world was going to come to an end. My business entrepreneurship career was going to come to an end. I sat down on my dining table in downtown Baltimore, Maryland, and started writing podcast nomics on my laptop. Okay. So we're kind of straight kind of to it people here. I'm starting this podcast, so I've been pretty lucky where I got some pretty name – guests in the entrepreneurial space. Uh, after you, I have a name by, a gentleman by the name of John Hamlin, who I think he's like a billionaire or if not close to it, the guy's wildly successful. Um, and I have a, a, a already booked some pretty name, big name clients I'm happy with. Uh, okay, great. So I'm getting some big name clients. I'm getting, like you said, some regular folks like us that are up and coming, right? So how do I monetize this? I have my strategy in my head, but from an expert who's a best-selling author, or somebody either wants a podcast or start a podcast, how can I best monetize this to make some real money? Let's start. So there are two different mediums. Let's start with the book first, and I'll tell you how I've sold more than 10,000 copies of my books today, and then we can move on to the podcast. That's a lot, so, guys. Real quick, that's a lot. The average self-published book sells 150, only 5%, some more than 500, and all books in the world, including the Bible, so on average, of course, the Bible is a high exception. So on average, of twenty five hundred units, um, twenty five hundred units uh, in its lifetime. So the fact that you sold ten thousand on the jump is fantastic. I, need, I needed to put in on that because it was deserved. So keep going. Sorry. Appreciate it. And and also, I, I should note, it's not just self published books. Published books uh, will be lucky to sell even two hundred to three hundred copies. Cool. I, I know various. I have various friends who've gone through big four, big five, whatever you call them now, I don't know how many there are, but big publishers, and um, they haven't even cracked 500 orders over a, a three to four year period. So let me share how, how I was able to do this. Number one I've noticed is a shorter, shorter to the point books, and this is nonfiction, I'm not talking about fiction here. So shorter to the point books tend to sell better than long 300 page, you know, nonfiction books. And this is surprising. Let me share a case study with you, Thomas. Okay. Uh, my book, 50 Shades of Marketing, it was a number one bestseller. Um, it sold probably in the podcast comics has been the bulk of my sales, but 50 Shades of Marketing has sold uh, probably a little more than 1500 to 2000 uh, copies. But here's, here's a surprising thing. 50 Shades of Marketing is about 220 pages long, about 50,000 words, pretty long book, you know, just like a regular book. What I did was I came out with a, as a test, I came out with another book called The New PR. This did not hit number one, 
But with the new PR, I took the most popular chapter from 50 Shades of Marketing. It's called the new PR. And I just turned that chapter into its own paperback, Kindle, and audiobook. So there are three different versions of the book. And I've now sold to date more audiobooks of the new PR, which came out a year after 50 Shades of Marketing, than I've sold of 50 Shades of Marketing. All right. And so, wait, this is important. This is important. Okay. You're talking big numbers, right? And we yeah. are, we're, we're like, we're, I'm going to say it on behalf of the listenership, we're a smarter group. Okay. So you sold 10,000 units. What was it called? What was the price of the book? Well, I've sold 10,000 total across all my books. Uh, Podcastnomics has sold approximately 8,000 copies. Okay. And uh, 50 Shades of Marketing has sold approximately 1,500 copies. Okay. So keep it simple. I'm three years old. The average blended price for both books were sold at to retail and wholesale to you. What, what was that price? Podcastnomics for Kindle was sold for or is sold for three ninety nine. Okay. And the paperback is sold for, uh, I think it's five ninety five or six ninety, maybe six ninety five. Okay. Fifty, 50 Shades of Marketing is sold for four ninety nine on Kindle, and the paperback is sold for ten ninety nine, I believe. I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna assume an average order value of five dollars each, ten thousand units, fifty thousand bucks, right? How did yes. you physically do it? Affiliate marketing, uh, social media, uh, tripping the Amazon engine engine through hacks. Give us the exact how you did it. A couple of things. I did all sorts of, uh, I was learning in the process and I wanted to learn as a marketer. I did Reddit, uh, Ask Me Anything, AMAs. I did, I bought Facebook ads. I did not do any Google AdWords, but I did uh, do some email marketing. I exported my LinkedIn contacts and their emails and uh, let people know through email. I posted all my social media. I even ran a giveaway on my Facebook and Instagram. I posted my book and said, if you want a free copy, leave your email address here and I'll send you a free copy of the book, but but you must leave a review if I do that. And, it, and I said, you know, it takes 30 seconds to leave a review. So I was able to build up my reviews on Amazon because I ran this campaign with my friends on my social media, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and I was able to drive up my reviews and Amazon, uh, I was able to price my book, run a free promotion giveaway. And uh, what I was able to do is I, I, I didn't have to pay anything out of pocket. I was able to uh, run a promotion, a, a free book promotion, and my friends got the free Kindle version and they left the reviews. And the more reviews you have on Amazon, uh, some algorithms go off within Amazon and they start promoting it more if they're seeing reviews and if they're seeing sales of the book. So even a free book that is given to your friends is booked as a sale for Amazon. Yeah, but don't you now, have to, don't you have to pay for that retail and then they'll take the fifteen percent? No, no. You can run a Amazon allows you to run free book promotions uh, once every quarter. So I just I ran it when the, after the book was released so that I could drive up my reviews. It's like a three to four day promotion that you can run. So your friends have ample time to get the book. And uh, yeah, nothing out of pocket because it's it's the Kindle version of the book. It's a Kindle and audiobook versions of the book, which are both digital. So there's no overhead associated with that. Got it. Okay. So quick takeaways. Word through network, gave away some freemium, you know, hey, give your email here, you get this, freemium products, um, uh, work with Amazon, tr uh, tricking the engine or tripping the engine, which I call uh, giving some giveaways, doing some... Um, uh, Facebook, let's call it PPC, not traditional PPC. I love all of it. Now, you may or may not know this. I'm expecting you to at your level. Do you know your acquisition cost per every unit sold? So uh, my acquisition, you know, I, I haven't calculated it simply because it's so low. Okay. And let, let, let me talk about one thing. Let me just talk about one thing. The most important marketing strategy I use to drive sales to uh, my books so for podcastnomics, initially I did all these that I told you, Facebook, you know, friend giveaway, Reddit AMA, and yeah, I got some sales, but it was not as, it, it wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought I would become a number one bestseller immediately and, you know, just rake in all those royalties. That was not the case. What I did find was a niche blog 
you know, kind of like you, Tom, you have a niche blog that's focused on millennial entrepreneurship. I found a niche blog focused on podcasting. I contacted the niche blog. I sent them a free copy of the book, the, the owner of the, the blog. I sent him a free copy and he responded back and he said, this is really good. Um, you know, I'll write, I'll write something up on it. So I said, all right, great. So he wrote something up on it. It was free advertising for me. Um, pretty much free advertising for me. And then I even told him, I said, look, you have an email list. I'll pay you money if you, if you recommend my book on your email list. Like if you straight up, instead of editorial, just send them a sales, a sales message and I'll write the copy and send it to your list. And so he said he had never solicited ads before, but that was fine. I paid him a couple of hundred dollars. And within 24 hours of that mailing going out, I had close to 100 sales of the book. The book reached uh, number one in its category on Amazon. It was like top 1,000, maybe top 2,000 in all of Amazon books. It was up there. I mean, it was beating like Malcolm Gladwell and... Tucker Max and Michael Lewis and all these big name nonfiction authors. I even took screenshots of my book being ahead of their book at the time. And so uh, after all that was said and done, you add all this together, the reviews, the ranking, the sales, Amazon took note. Amazon took note. No, 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 Rush, I, I get it. You tr you basically take massive action, right? And you hit yep. it through a few different channels and whether you, I'll say, cajole the system a bit or it happens organically, you basically got Amazon to work for you, correct? Exactly. Okay, I love it. Okay, now, uh, I do want to ask an important question because, you know, we're getting, um, we're getting tighter on the show and we're evolving as a show. So I want to tighten this up a little bit. We're both smart guys, right? So I'm going to keep it simple. If you were to take a dollar in from an Amazon sale, so what I want to do is I want to take 15 cents out for uh, them. I want, I'm just doing rough numbers. I want to take maybe 10% for maybe you had some costs up front with a designer, an editor, whatever, right? We're at 25%. And let's throw in another 15 cents for marketing costs, right? So we're at roughly like 40 cents, 50 cents on a dollar, right? So a dollar comes in, just go with me on this. And you're going to keep okay. 50 cents, right? Going by yeah. what you're saying, right, it's costing you only 10 cents or whatever. I'm making this up. So you're making roughly 40 cents per book. If that's the case, you would scale this up until it costs you 40 cents if you're, if you're as smart as I thought. Why not do that, brother? Well, I... I the answer to your question is I don't know if there's much more I can do right now to spend to improve the book. So I do what I can. I still run promotions. I drop a couple of hundred bucks a year, but Amazon is now doing free advertising for me and I'm getting, you know, I'm getting orders in every day, you know, in my sleep. Okay. I wake up and I see a few more I, orders. I got it. I see I, for, for people listening. I, and I, I'm going to answer for you if it's okay. You basically sold 10,000 units, let's keep it simple, and it probably cost you about 1,000 bucks, right? Now, yep. marginally, if you sold a unit, it might cost you a dollar, and you might not make as much money. You kinda, you, 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 you sold the stock before the crash. Is that fair to say? Um, I'm not sure if that's a proper metaphor. Largely, I'm all about spending money if it's gonna return yeah. money. And I haven't found any additional channels to spend that money. Okay, let, let's so, ref, let, we'll, I'll rephrase it. Okay. You, you caught it before it hit the law of diminishing returns. Is that fair? Yep. Okay, beautiful. Okay, yeah. okay, now, you didn't write books to make 50 grand. You wrote books to make 50 million. How did you and how are you leveraging this status and this ecosystem to be successful right now in your digital marketing firm? A uh, couple of things. Number one, the books have brought me so much business. They brought me new clients, people who I would have never connected with because my contact information is in the book, my email address, my name, you know, that's my, my name is really Naresh Vissa. So uh, I've gotten a good amount of business. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of business to Krish Media Marketing. Um, and this is largely because of the content that's in the book. It resonates with people and they have follow-up questions where they 
you know, the book is too much for them and they just want to hire me as a, as a contractor or consultant or whatever it is so that they can get up and running with whatever initiative that they need. The other thing I want to mention with book writing is if you want to write a book to make money, uh, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be very disappointed. You're going to be very, very disappointed because it's hard. Like you mentioned, you know, some of these, the average book will be lucky to sell 200 to 300 copies a year. So, um, so I have a passion, you know, going back to my journalism background, I had a passion for writing and for helping people and sharing wisdom, uh, with, with the public. That's why I write my books. Um, and of course, if I can make money at it at the same time, great. And that's what I've done. And now I sell my services to other authors and other publishing companies because I help them sell more books too. So I make money in the process. But when I sat down in my condo uh, in, in downtown Baltimore to write podcast nomics, the writing was coming from my mind and from the heart. It was not coming with the intention of I need to sell 10,000 copies of this book. So I highly recommend if you can't write, if you struggle with writing, if you don't like to write, if you're not knowledgeable about a specific topic, then don't even bother writing the book because it's going to come through in your writing and you will struggle to sell it. Okay. Now, um, I like where this is going. Okay. So you wrote the book, you leverage it to getting more business. Uh, maybe you might have able to raise your retainer. Uh, maybe people sought you on inbound marketing or on outbound marketing, use it as a frame of reference. So I think the learning here and one of the key takeaways from Nourish is that you got to build a platform for yourself. So for example, if you, love, yeah, so if you love to write, write a book, right? And there's strategies that you can use to employ Amazon as a, a partner to work for you for a little or uh, no money. And you could also maybe even hire consultants such as Narish, who did it himself or obviously for a fee, which may be worth it than learning through mistakes. So that makes sense. Then once you establish your platform, you can sell into your platform. Give me an example of a product or service that I bought your book, I got on your email list, and then you attracted a large contract as a result. You know, So give us an example of that because I assume that probably happened a few times. Yeah, with, with 50 Shades of Marketing, that got me, uh, well, first off, I should say on top of the business, I've also, I wouldn't be on your podcast today if, if I didn't write these books. I, right. I've spoken at conferences online, online summits, conferences around the country. Um, and so all that has boosted up my, my branding. Now, to answer your question, 50 Shades of Marketing came out. It's all about the online and digital marketplace. I had a prospective client contact me because they found 50 Shades of Marketing. This client runs a very large PR firm and they said that they have all these clients, all these clients who need PR. Now her firm though does not offer any service outside of PR. They only offer, you know, press release services, yeah. uh, media booking services, but there are all these other branding items that go into PR, like uh, having a good website, a logo design, if they want to start a podcast, starting a podcast, starting a blog, um, affiliate marketing, best-selling book campaigns. There are all sorts of PR initiatives that this firm wasn't doing. And so now we have a partnership and they just refer business to me. So they funnel in people for PR efforts and for all the other efforts Instead of them trying to hire people to do it, instead of them trying to learn how to do it, they just refer it over to me. I'm a partner of theirs, and we take care of all those services for those clients. Love it. Love it. And uh, I, I don't want to – got to wrap it up soon. I don't want to diminish your other efforts. You have uh, uh, your agency where you work on behalf of people, but then you also publish uh, in the financial space. Why don't you spend a little time about that because that's the other thing. What, okay. So you kind of have an option, folks, if you want to get into the space. You can either be an agent where people say, hey, I want you to get my message out there, and you create content, do SEO, and all this fun stuff. They'll pay you for it, and they'll pay handsomely if done correctly. Or you can be do it for yourself and for your brand, or you can strictly be a content provider, and then maybe an agency or that person may use it. So there's a few different ways to skin it. And the thing I like about Norish is he has his hands in a few different pots. Talk us a little bit about the financial um, website and the content you provide for that site 
and run us through that a little bit. Yeah, so those sites uh, have nothing to do with Chris Media Marketing. Those are completely separate businesses with my own business partners. They're financial publishing companies. Uh, one of them is called Normandy Investment Research, and the other one is called Moneyball Economics. Um, they're both independent of each other. Normandy Investment Research provides options trading research to uh, regular retail investors, and Moneyball Economics provides broad economic research and also has a, a paid newsletter um, that tells people it, it forecasts earnings before they're released, before the, the publicly traded companies release their earnings. So we help people make more money through options and through stock trading. I got involved in this uh, right after grad school. I worked for the largest financial publishing company in the world called Stansbury Research and learned the business, learned the ins and outs. And during my time there, learned about online marketing because I didn't know anything about e-commerce or the digital marketplace. I learned it all there and, um, and then went out on my own and, and I'll do what I do, which I've talked about today on your show. Sweet. Okay. How can we find you? NareshVissa.com. That's my first name and last name, NareshVissa.com. Get on my free newsletter. And I also want to let your listeners know about a giveaway I'm running. If you subscribe to my newsletter and uh, you can contact me through my site, NareshVissa.com, I will send you a free copy of uh, either Podcastonomics or Fifty Shades of Marketing, whatever you prefer. I'll send you a free uh, Kindle and a free audiobook version. So if you want those free books, I think combined they're like a $20. Actually, it would be like a $35 retail value. Um, I will send those to you for free. So get on my mailing list, contact me, and I will I will hook you up with free copies of Fifty Shades of Marketing and Podcastonomics. Love it. And and so some people know why he's doing it. For those folks who are, we do have some novices, and we, they do have some questions. He sees a value per email greater than having you in his ecosystem, meaning, hey, by having Tom Lavecchia subscribe to it, I may get three free books at a value of at least $30 or whatever the retail value is. He sees a value of me and having my email greater than $30, right? And there's many things Naresh is working on that he can sell me. But more importantly, what he's also going to work on. So I think what makes good entrepreneurs from great entrepreneurs is he sees a value of data and building up the ecosystem. So just, you know, Nubrish, I always try to educate our folks because, again, we do have some folks that are listening and know why we're yep. doing it, right? But it doesn't hurt to educate. We're going to do this a quick uh, speed round. So I'm going to ask you some direct questions. Um, and uh, I'm, going to add, I'm going to ask you to answer in one sentence or less. Ready to go. I'm ready to go. Best day of your life. Uh, well, there, uh, it was actually spending time with my family. I had family fly in from all around the world for a special event. Um, it was a religious event for me, and that was it. It actually inside felt like the best day of my life. It had nothing to do with money or business or anything. Just being with loved ones. Worst day of your life. You know, uh, all, all days, I try to make all days really good. So uh, I, I'm, I'm knocking on wood right now that I won't be having the worst day of my life anytime soon. Most money made in a day? $20,000. Sweet. Most money lost in a day? Uh, I think uh, about $2,000. So, okay. Cool. All right. And then uh, and what's loss? Not purchases, but loss. Got it. Uh, single or married? About to get engaged. Oh, shit. I hope you don't have to <laughs> If you need me to, if you need me to, I, dude, I got to post this in 24 hours. So that's your fault for answering that way. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, good luck on that. And then keep us posted because, uh, you know, you're now family and then the new theory family. Uh, guys, uh, this is a continuation of the New Theory Podcast. Narish, any parting words? Everybody, if you're sitting at that corporate desk job and you're banging your head against a desk, now is a better time than ever before. It's only going to get better moving forward. Leave that job. Well, don't leave yet. Start doing something on the side 
and uh, work your way up, learn as much as you can, and then leave that job so you can buy yourself financial freedom. And more importantly, forget about the financial stuff, just freedom in your life. Love it, brother. That is Narish Bisa, who is a rock star, best-selling author, digital marketer, financial purveyor of information. I could probably give him about four or five other monikers. Glad to have you on the show. And uh, look into his website. We'll give some links below. And uh, check out the free book offer.